This year, it came amid the raging Israel-Palestine conflict. According to UNICEF, children make up 47% of Gaza's 2.3 million population. Since the 7th of October, reportedly over 5,500 children have been killed in daily Israeli bombings. That is, one Palestinian child is killed every 10 minutes, or one out of every 200 children in the Gaza Strip has been killed. Heart-wrenching stories such as that of 33-year-old Fida has tragically been a constant ever since the bombings began. They destroyed an entire neighborhood and no less than 50 martyrs were recovered from the rubble. I walked over 50 bodies looking for my son. My son, whom I was happy to see grow by every centimeter, they robbed him from me. I was looking for body parts for my son. In the end, my other younger son told me, Mom, here's Ude. I could only identify him by his belt. He was wearing all black. I couldn't identify him at first because of the fire and the dust. At least an additional 1,800 children are missing under the rubble, most of them presumed dead. A further 9,000 children have been injured, many of them with life-changing consequences. One shudders to imagine the trauma of multiple wars they have lived through. A month into the war, on the 6th of November, the United Nations Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, likened the bombard Gaza Strip to a graveyard for children and urged for an immediate ceasefire. Gaza is becoming a graveyard for children. Hundreds of girls and boys are reportedly being killed or injured every day. The way forward is clear. A humanitarian ceasefire now. All parties respecting all their obligations under international humanitarian law now. This means the unconditional release of the hostages in Gaza now. Nothing can justify the deliberate torture, killing, injuring, and kidnapping of civilians. The protection of civilians must be paramount. I'm deeply concerned about clear violations of international humanitarian law that we are witnessing. Let me be clear, no party to an armed conflict is above international humanitarian law. Apart from the daily attacks, Israel's total blockade on Gaza meant no food or water could enter Gaza territory. Gazans, especially children, found themselves at risk of dehydration and malnourishment even though they were prioritized by their families for whatever little supplies available to them. For those lucky enough to survive these indiscriminate attacks, learning to survive without their family members could be a lifelong struggle. Reportedly, many more children have been killed in Gaza every day compared with Ukraine, Afghanistan, Iraq and other conflict zones. Not that any reminder is needed but a child whether in Israeli or Palestinian, is a child and must be protected. Tehran has unveiled an upgraded version of its hypersonic missile on the 19th of November. The Iranian show of strength has come on the heels of the heightened U.S. military presence in the region and puts U.S.'s chief ally Israel, Iran's regional arch enemy, well within its range. Now, Tehran claims that the new missile, Fatah-2, is capable of evading the air defense systems with its hypersonic maneuvers, which is, of course, being interpreted as a whale jibe at the rival Israel and also its many air defense systems. So, how good is this new missile by Iran? Our next port gets you the details. Iran's supreme leader, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, visited a university in Tehran run by the Aerospace Division of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps on the 19th of November. An array of arms was on display which included the upgraded version of the Fatah hypersonic missile named Fatah-2. In June this year, Tehran had unveiled its first 
indigenously made hypersonic ballistic missile called FATA, thereby joining a small club of countries including China and Russia. This exclusive club boasts of an arsenal with weapons capable of travelling long distances with strong maneuverability. FATA-2 missile is a hypersonic glide vehicle or HGV, a projectile that glides to its target after the initial launch. What makes it far more destructive is substantially more maneuverability, compared to a ballistic warhead travelling in a more predictable arc pattern. FATA-2 is capable of moving at a speed of up to Mach 15, which is equivalent to 5.1 km per second. It has a range of 1,400 km. In June, the IRGC officials had said they planned to improve the range of hypersonic to 2,000 km, which would effectively bring Israel, Iran's arch enemy, well within its range. Apart from the Fatah-2 missile, among the array of weapons on display was an Iranian-made Gaza drone. A new version of the Shahid series of unmanned aerial vehicles and a few missile defence systems. Condemning Israel and its Western allies for their war on the Gaza Strip, Ayatollah Khomeini appealed to the Muslim states to cut off ties with Israel. Some Muslim governments sometimes condemn the bombings in assemblies and statements and the like. Some don't even do that. This condemnation is not enough. They should cut off this vital artery of the Zionist regime. They should not allow oil, energy, goods and the like to enter the Zionist regime. They should limit their political relations with the Zionist regime, at least for a limited period of time. Let's say, one year or less or even more. Cut off. If they want these crimes to stop, this tragedy to stop and end, this is their duty. Khamenei's ire was directed not only towards Israel, but its Western allies as well. Calling the Zionist regime a symbol of racism, he claimed that the Western backing for the nearly two months long bombing of the enclave amounts to Western leaders' indulgence in racism. Since the escalation of conflict between Israel and Palestine on the 7th of October, Lebanon's Hezbollah and Yemen's Houthis have engaged in cross-border fighting with Israel. Both these groups fall under the umbrella of Iran-backed resistance axis. Iran's missile arsenal is believed to be the largest and most diverse in the Middle East. US General Kenneth F. McKenzie Jr., who retired as the head of US Central Command, claimed at the beginning of this year that Iran has over 3,000 ballistic missiles of various types, with some capable of reaching Tel Aviv. Another former State Department non-proliferation official, Mark Fitzpatrick, claimed that Iran has at least nine ballistic missiles that could successfully carry and trigger a nuclear weapon to its target. Iran's investment in the past decade in improving the precision and lethality of its weapons has proved to be a potent threat to the US and its partner military forces in the region. Now, with the unveiling of Fatah II, that threat has become all the more credible. Pyongyang has claimed that it successfully launched a military spy satellite into orbit late on the 21st of November. Now, Tuesday's launch was Pyongyang's third attempt at securing a military eye in the sky after earlier two failed ventures in the month of May and August earlier this year. North Korean state media has claimed that within hours of the launch, the North Korean leader Kim Jong-un reviewed images of the American military bases in Guam. In an immediate fallout of the launch, South Korea partially suspended a five-year-old military accord. In retaliation, North Korea fully suspended the deal and has also beefed up its security at the borders. Our next poll gets more details. Heralding a new era of space power, Pyongyang on Wednesday claimed to have put its first spy satellite into orbit and vowed further satellite launches and even a nuclear test next year. These launches, Pyongyang reasons, are a defense against what it calls its enemy's dangerous military maneuvers. 
The military spy satellite named Maligyong-1 was launched late Tuesday on a new carrier rocket, Cholima-1. Tuesday's launch was North Korea's third attempt after two failed tries in May and August. And the first since its leader Kim Jong-un's rare trip to Russia in September. Russian President Vladimir Putin is believed to have promised to help Pyongyang build satellites. Seoul's intelligence agency also claimed that Pyongyang had received Russian assistance for its successful launch. Pyongyang is believed to have provided Moscow with the blueprint and data relevant to the first and second failed satellite launches. Russia, in turn, analyzed the data provided and gave Pyongyang the crucial feedback. Though acknowledging the launch's success, the intelligence agency cautioned that it was too early to say if the satellite was working as Pyongyang claimed. Soon after the launch, Seoul suspected, albeit partially, a 2018 military accord between the two Koreas and deployed surveillance and reconnaissance assets to its border. The South Korean defense chief called it an essential measure to defend against the nuclear-armed North's growing threats. North Korea, in turn, called the move reckless, suspended the deal in full, and said it would restore all the military measures it had halted under the deal with South Korea. From now on, our army will not be restricted by the 9.19 North-South Korea military agreement. We will withdraw the military actions that were taken to prevent military tension and conflict everywhere, including the ground, sea and air. Also, we will forward deploy more powerful armed forces and new type military equipment in the region along the military demarcation line. About a fifth of all satellites launched belongs to the military and are used primarily for spying purposes. Though every major country has a military satellite, the US, China and Russia are perched on the top three positions, with 239, 140 and 105 military satellites respectively. North Korea's official Korean Central Television, or KCTV, said that the military spy satellite will formally start its, its reconnaissance mission. From the 1st of December, after finishing 7 to 10 days of fine-tuning process, though adding that it was already transmitting images. Successfully putting a spy satellite into orbit would improve North Korea's intelligence gathering capabilities, particularly over South Korea. Additionally, it would provide crucial data in any military conflict, enabling Pyongyang to target its enemy's position a whole lot better. The launch appears to have kicked off a space race on the Korean peninsula, with Seoul planning to launch its first spy satellite via a SpaceX rocket later this month. Will Pyongyang's military spy satellite launch prove to be a harbinger of things to come? Well, the early signs are rather ominous. And with that, it's a wrap on this edition of World at War. And if you want to reach out to me with any comments, feedback or suggestions, please feel free to do so on the ID that you're seeing on your screens. I'm your host, Mohammed Saleh, and I'll see you again next week. It's the second day of the truce between Israel and Hamas, and a much-awaited second round of hostage exchange has taken place. Hamas has released 13 Israelis and four Thai nationals in exchange for the freedom of another 39 Palestinian prisoners. This is how Hamas's armed wing released the hostages from captivity. The hostages were handed over to the Red Cross for safe passage into Israel. Going now. Goodbye. Welcome. Good Good the Red Cross vehicles carried the second round of released hostages through Egypt's Rafah border crossing. And finally, cars ferried the hostages through the south of Israel to camps that were set up by the Israeli Defense Forces for the rehabilitation of the freed hostages.
Some of the 13 Israelis and four Thai nationals released from Hamas captivity arrived at the Sheba Medical Center in Israel today. Black ones carrying the released hostages arrived at the hospital under tight security. The entire exchange is being monitored by Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Netanyahu has been monitoring the exchange process since yesterday. In return, Israeli prison authorities released 39 Palestinian detainees. The prisoners were welcomed home in East Jerusalem. Celebrations broke out in several parts of Palestine, of West Bank, the cel to celebrate the release of the prisoners from Israeli jails. But the second hostage prisoner exchange took several hours to materialize. Hamas delayed the second release yesterday, claiming that Israel it had failed to comply with the preset terms regarding the entry of relief trucks into northern Gaza. Disagreement over the criteria for releasing prisoners also led to the delay. Hamas decided to continue the temporary truce only after Egypt and Qatar assured that Israel it would abide by all the agreed terms. Now for more on this, we were earlier joined by Edward P. Joseph, Senior Fellow at the Johns Hopkins University, School of Advanced International Studies and Foreign Policy Analyst. Listen in. It's very welcome news to anyone who is concerned about human suffering, and that is the suffering of both Palestinian civilians in Gaza and also Israeli families and an entire nation of Israel that is uh, so concerned and worried about the hostages that were criminally taken by Hamas on October 7th. And so this is, comes, this is welcome relief to have this release of these hostages, one as young as three years old, as young as three years old. And this comes, of course, uh, thanks in part to President Biden's personal intervention here. It shows how concerned the President of the United States is President Biden spoke with the Emir of uh, Qatar this morning to uh, ensure that the uh, uh, prepared and arranged uh, hostage release, the exchange, the release of uh, Palestinian prisoners and the release of the Israeli hostages criminally seized, abducted uh, there um, it, it, from Israel on October 7th would proceed. And indeed it did. And this is uh, give some momentum and some hope that there will be a further truce and that is calm for Palestinian civilians, uh, increased humanitarian aid for Palestinian civilians, and of course, further release of Israeli hostages and internationals that have nothing to do with this conflict, including uh, those Thai civilians uh, who were released. Please. For more on this, we're now being joined by Alan Burstein. Mr. Burstein is an assistant professor and an Israel Institute fellow at Department of Political Science at the University of California. Sir, thank you so much for joining us on the show. Thank you for having me. Good morning. Uh, Mr. Burstein, of course, the second batch of hostages have been released. Palestinian prisoners have been freed as well. This is the second day of the truce. Two more days to go in this four-day truce. How do you see things materializing going forward? We have, of course, seen some delays already. There has been some back and forth as well. First, we saw the delay in when this truce would start. Then we saw the delay when it came through the second batch of the hostage release. What's your take on how things will unfold going forward? I expect that the deal will actually be completed within the four days. Both sides have a vested interest in completing the deal. Hamas desperately needs the four-day truce in order to regroup and wants to show Palestinians that the attack on October 7th was worth it and they're managing to free Palestinian prisoners. In turn, Israel desperately needs the release of hostages also to show that they're actually achieving something in the war so far. So both sides have a vested interest despite all the problems and specifically that we saw today. Both sides will probably complete the deal. I'm not saying that it's going to go smoothly. Both sides deeply mistrust each other, and negotiating teams are working with Israel, Qatar, and Egypt throughout the night right now in order to try to figure out how they are going to make sure that the following day Hamas does not again say that Israel is violating the deal or that Israel does not say that Hamas is violating the deal. So they're both trying to work on that right now because both sides really do have a vested interest in it, at least the four days coming through. 
Right, Mr. Bastian, of course, uh, we spoke of Qatar and Egypt as well. The hope here is that this truce can be extended before, beyond the uh, agreed on four days. Do you think that is likely to happen? So again, I think each side has an interest in that happening. Hamas sent indications today through Egypt that it has managed to, quote unquote, find 10 or 20 other hostages that fit the criteria, the criteria being either women or minors under the age of 19 that can be released. And according to the initial deal, if Hamas releases upwards of 10 hostages, Israeli hostages, per day, it can buy itself, so to speak, another day of truce. So they are indicating that they are interested in trying to get that to get that be the case. I'm not sure that they actually will. But again, I think both sides really have an interest in that happening. So Hamas is indicating that they might. I suspect that what may happen is on day four, Hamas may say they can make that happen, but they need another day or two in order to ensure that. So then Israel is going to be faced with the dilemma. Is it going to continue the on the fighting right now or wait another day or two hamas is going to try to draw out the truce as much as possible but i do think that it is likely that both sides will try to extend the truce by at least a day or two i'm not sure if they trust each other to make it work but i think they will both try right uh, mr burson of course uh, the, we've also seen uproar against israeli prime minister benjamin netanyahu what do you think how is this going to play out back at home for benjamin netanyahu so Israel's political system has been in very big turmoil for the last year before the war. Um, Netanyahu's position was a very, very right-wing government, and there were the biggest protests Israel's ever seen um, out in the streets. Then there was this war, and this is really damaging the image of Netanyahu because he has sold himself for the last 16 years as Israel's Mr. Security, as the one who will bring security, will bring defense. And then in come the greatest tragedy that befell Israel in 50 years under his watch and all the years that he has not actually taken out Hamas like he promised that he would. So his position is very, very precarious. Right now, though, it tends to happen in most countries when there's a war. So most people say, OK, but deal with the disputes later. Don't actually go against the government now. I think the fact that we're seeing growing protests now is showing the extent to which the population is unhappy with him. That even in a time of war, the population is saying we still need to change who is leading the government because there's no trust whatsoever that Netanyahu will not change the goals of the war or prolong the war or, ch or expand the goals or something like that due to his political situation. So because of that deep mistrust in Israel, the protest movement is already starting. Usually we would see it waiting to the war's end. Yeah. Here we're seeing already brewing underground. All right. Well, Professor Burson, thank you so much for joining us on World DNA with your insights on this. Thank you. Now we're starting with all the updates on the hostage prisoner swap. Emotional scenes were unfolding as Israeli children and women held captive by Hamas militants in Gaza for a grueling 49 days were released and finally reunited with their families under Qatar and Egypt as well as US broker deal. Israeli families welcomed the second group of hostages after Hamas had delayed the release by several hours earlier, accusing Israel of violating the terms of the true steel. The last minute delay created a tense standoff but ultimately went through after international mediation efforts. One can only imagine the plight of the families that have been waiting for the hostages to come back home. Emily Hand had her ninth birthday as a hostage in Gaza, the day before she was reunited with her father, who initially believed she'd been killed in the devastating attack by a masked gunman on southern Israel last month. <laughs> You can see these visuals on your screens right now. Rounding the corner of a hospital corridor, nine-year-old Ohad Ran, hurling himself into the arms of his father after being held by militants in Gaza for nearly seven weeks. The young boy who spent his ninth birthday as a hostage in Gaza was among four children freed from captivity. We started a campaign uh, a day ago that for celebrating with Ohad, every, everyone who can uh, should uh, hang a balloon wherever he wants, uh, on the car, on the houses, in the offices. 
Uh, the color is not that uh, important, but uh, Ohad liked uh, the team that Ohad liked in uh, Israel. Their uh, uh, color is red. A relative of a freed nine-year-old Israeli boy said that the puzzle not yet complete after the family reunion. Three out of four family members of the Munda family. Nine-year-old Ohad, his mother Karen and grandmother Ruthie were released from captivity in Gaza and brought back to Israeli soil. Ruthie's 78-year-old husband, Avraham Munder, still remains in Gaza, in Hamas's custody. Not just this family, many other families were united. An Israeli father rejoiced at reuniting with his wife and daughters who returned to Israel on Friday after being held hostage for weeks by Hamas. Yoni Katz Asher hugged his family. Schneider's children, Schneider Children Medical Center, pardon me, after their 50-day ordeal. For Yoni Katz Asher, whose wife and children were freed from Hamas captivity, there was happiness mingled with concern for those who remained in Gaza still. Others echoed that sentiment. Among them, Adva and Elon, the grandchildren of 85-year-old Yafa Adar as well. Thankfully, our grandmother returned yeah. home yesterday. After almost 50 days in captivity, we got a chance to hug her again. We are very moved from her strength and from the way she was able to uh, uh, survive this experience. So I ask you, all of you, all the international community, don't, don't stop fighting. We will fight. To, for all of them, we will demand the return. And then there's five-year-old Emilia Loni, who was released with her mother, Danielle, and was reunited with their grandmother. In pictures released by the SEMS, Emilia can be seen in a tight embrace with her grandmother. IDF released video of its preparations for the reception of the hostages at the Karim Shalom. They dubbed the operation as Heaven's Door. In a period of four days, a total of 50 Israeli hostages are to be exchanged for 150 Palestinian prisoners. It's the second day of the truce between Israel and Hamas, and a much-awaited second round of hostage exchange has taken place. Hamas released 13 Israelis and four Thai hostages in exchange for the freedom of another 39 Palestinian prisoners. This is how Hamas's armed wing released the hostages from captivity. The hostages were handed over to the Red Cross for safe passage into Israel. Bye now. Goodbye. Red Cross vehicles carried the second round of released hostages through Egypt's Rafah border crossing. And finally, the hostages were taken through the south of Israel to camps that were set up by the Israeli Defense Forces for the rehabilitation of the captives. The entire exchange of hostages was monitored by Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Netanyahu has been monitoring the exchange since yesterday. In return, Israeli prison authorities released 39 Palestinians. The prisoners were welcomed home in East Jerusalem. The most prominent individual that was released was Isra Jabez, who was convicted of detonating a gas cylinder in a car at a checkpoint in 2015. She was sentenced to 11 years in prison for wounding a police officer. Celebrations broke out in several parts of Palestine's West Bank to celebrate the release of prisoners from Israeli jails. But the second hostage prisoner exchange, it took several hours to materialize. Hamas delayed the second release yesterday, claiming that Israel it had failed to comply with the preset terms regarding the entry of relief trucks into northern Gaza. Disagreement over the criteria for releasing prisoners also led to the delay. Hamas decided to continue the temporary truce. 
only after Egyptians and Qataris assured that Israel would abide by all agreed terms. Now, as the temporary truce begins to settle in with the exchange of hostages and prisoners, protests too continue to flare up in Israel for the speedy release of all hostages. Thousands gathered at the hostages square in Tel Aviv at a massive rally in support of the hostages. The march was spearheaded by women from Tel Aviv's Habima Square to Hostages Square. Singers shared the stage with parents of the hostages as they held up images of the captives. Chants for the freedom of hostages filled the air around the protest site. We are here tonight because we are very uh, happy for the people who come back to their families. But we have to uh, keep going with our um, work to bring them back with our uh, efforts to bring them back, all of them. Uh, it's only the beginning. Meanwhile, thousands also gathered in Jerusalem to protest against Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's mishandling of the hostage situation, bolstering their accusation with chants of guilty. Protesters condemned Netanyahu, demanded his resignation from the Prime Minister's office. <laughs> Benjamin Netanyahu, the current Prime Minister of Israel, to leave his job because he is the one responsible for the October 7th disaster, the biggest one we had in the history of Israel, where 400 people were, 400 people were murdered and uh, babies, women and children were kidnapped, raped and burned to death. We need him to go. He is responsible. We need him to go now, yesterday. Emotional scenes were unfolding as Israeli children and women held captive by Hamas militants in Gaza for a gru grueling 49 days were released and finally reunited with their families under a Qatar, Egyptian and U.S. brokered deal. Israeli families welcomed the second group of hostages and after Hamas had delayed the release by several hours, accusing Israel of violating the terms of the truce deal, the last-minute delay created a tense standoff but ultimately went through after international mediation efforts. Emily Hand had her ninth birthday as a hostage in Gaza the day before she was reunited with her father, who initially believed she had been killed in the devastating attack by Hamas gunmen on southern Israel last month. Rounding the corner of a hospital corridor, Nine-year-old Ohad ran, hurling himself into the arms of his father after being held by militants in Gaza for nearly seven weeks. The young boy who spent his ninth birthday as a hostage in Gaza was among four young children freed from captivity. We started a campaign uh, a day ago that for celebrating with Ohad, every, everyone who can uh, should uh, hang a balloon wherever he wants, uh, on the car, on the houses, in the offices. Uh, the color is not that uh, important, but uh, Ohad liked, uh, the team that Ohad liked in uh, Israel, their uh, uh, color is red. A relative of freed nine-year-old Israeli boy said that the puzzle not yet complete after family reunion, three out of four family members of the Munda family, nine-year-old Ohad, his mother Karen and grandmother Ruthie, 
were released from captivity in Gaza and brought back to the Israeli soil. Ruthie's 78-year-old husband, Avram Munda, still remains in Gaza in Hamas's custody. Oh, it was uh, it's an emotional roller coaster because, of course, we feel tremendous uh, happiness that we got reunited with three of our families, uh, family members. Uh, my aunt Ruth just came back to, uh, yesterday together with Karen, her daughter, and her grandson, Ohad, who is nine years old. But it's, have, it's a mixed emotion uh, moment because also my uncle Abraham is still there and we don't have any information about his well-being. Now, not just this family, many other families were united and Israeli father rejoiced at reuniting with his wife and daughters who returned to Israel on Friday after being held hostage for weeks by Hamas. Yoni Katz hugged his family at the Children's Medical Center after the 50-day ordeal. <laughs> For Yoni Katz, whose wife and children were freed from Hamas captivity, there was happiness mingled with concern for those who remained in Gaza. אחיותינו נמצאים בשעה זו בשבי. יש אנשים שבשעה זו ליבם נשבר, ואני רוצה לוודא שכל החטופים עד האחרון ישוב הביתה. משפחת החטופים הם לא פוסטרים, הם לא סלוגן, אלו אנשים אמיתיים, ומשפחת החטופים מהיום הם המשפחה החדשה שלי. Among them, Adwa and Alon, the grandchildren of 85-year-old Yafadar. Our grandmother returned home yesterday. After almost 50 days in captivity, we got a chance to hug her again. We are very moved from her strength and from the way she was able to uh, uh, survive this experience. I ask you, all of you, all the international community, don't don't stop fighting we will fight to for all of them we will demand their return another child five-year-old emilia alani who was released with her mother daniele was reunited with her grandma now in photos released by the SEMS, emilia can be seen in a tight embrace with her grandmother idf released video of its preparations for the reception of the hostages at the karim shalom and they dubbed the operation as Heaven's Door. In a period of four days, a total of 50 Israeli hostages are to be exchanged for 150 Palestinian prisoners. It's the second day of the truce between Israel and Hamas, and a much-awaited second round of hostage exchange has taken place. Hamas has released 13 Israeli and four Thai hostages in exchange for the freedom of another 39 Palestinian prisoners and detainees. This is how Hamas's armed wing released the hostages from captivity. The hostages were handed over to the Red Cross for safe passage into Israel. Bye now. Goodbye. Welcome. Good work. The doctor waiting also there, so... Okay. Okay, okay. The Red Cross vehicles carried the second round of the released hostages through Egypt's Rafa border crossing.
And finally, the cars ferry the hostages through the south of Israel to camps set up by the Israeli Defense Forces for the rehabilitation of the captives. The entire exchange of hostages, it was monitored by Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Netanyahu has been monitoring the exchange process since yesterday. In return, the Israeli prison authorities released 13 Palestinian detainees. The prisoners were welcomed home in East Jerusalem. The most prominent individual released was Isra Jabez, who was convicted of detonating a gas cylinder in the car at a checkpoint in 2015. She was sentenced to 11 years in prison for wounding a police officer. Celebrations broke out in several parts of Palestine's West Bank to celebrate the release of prisoners from Israeli jails. But the second hostage prisoner exchange took several hours to materialize. Hamas delayed the second release yesterday, claiming that Israel had failed to comply with the preset terms regarding the entry of relief trucks into northern Gaza. Disagreement over the criteria for releasing prisoners also led to the delay. Hamas decided to continue the temporary truce only after Egyptians and Qataris assured that Israel would abide by all of the agreed terms. Now for more on this, we are being joined by Edward P. Joseph. Mr. Joseph is a senior fellow at Johns Hopkins University, School of Advanced International Studies and Foreign Policy Analyst. Sir, thank you so much for joining us on the show. You're welcome. So as I mentioned, the second batch of hostages have been released. This, of course, did not happen with, without its share of issues. As we know, this deal was delayed. The second batch, the release of the second batch of hostages, it was delayed. Now, what's your take on how the truce has proceeded so far? Well, so far, this comes as very welcome news to anyone who is concerned about human suffering, and that is the suffering of both Palestinian civilians in Gaza and also Israeli families and an entire nation of Israel that is uh, so concerned and worried about the hostages that were criminally taken by Hamas on October 7th. And so this is, comes This is welcome relief to have this release of these hostages, one as young as three years old, as young as three years old. And this comes, of course, uh, thanks in part to President Biden's personal intervention here. It shows how concerned the president of the United States is. President Biden spoke with the emir of uh, Qatar this morning to uh, ensure that the uh, uh, prepared and arranged uh, hostage release, the exchange, the release of uh, Palestinian prisoners and the release of the Israeli hostages criminally seized, abducted uh, there um, it, it, from Israel on October 7th would proceed. And indeed it did. And this is uh, gives some momentum and some hope that there will be a further truce and that is calm for Palestinian civilians, uh, increased humanitarian aid for Palestinian civilians. And of course, further release of Israeli hostages and internationals that have nothing to do with this conflict, including uh, those Thai civilians uh, who were released. Please. Uh, right, sir. Absolutely. That being said, despite there being some concrete progress in this war on ground, uproar and protests have continued. We've seen there's a lot of agitation still. What is your assessment of how things will proceed going forward? Israel, as we know, has made it clear that this is not the end of the war and that the war will continue. So it's fair to say that their hunt for Hamas will continue. So what's your assessment of how things will go forward? Well, I would say that the, uh, as you put it, the hunt for Hamas uh, has international backing. This has uh, the backing of President Biden, who has not stated that Israel has to agree to a uh, a ceasefire, some uh, type of agreed, prolonged uh, uh, halt to the military operation against Hamas. President Biden, of course, wants Israel to focus on Hamas and to do uh, take maximum efforts to minimize uh, uh, the uh, Palestinian civilian casualties. That's what President Biden wants to see. But there's there's no pressure. Even uh, here from uh, within President Biden's own party, you have Bernie Sanders who has no hesitation to call Hamas a terrorist organization. He wants, he uh, representing the, the, the progressive left wing of the uh, Democratic Party, calls on Israel to stop indiscriminate bombardment. But even Bernie Sanders 
This is this is the, the left wing progressive leader in the United States does not call for Israel to, to halt the military campaign against Hamas. So and Israel retains a lot of support within the European Union, uh, <clears throat> also with, uh, from Canada. So the, the 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 operation uh, to oust Hamas, uh, not to um, uh, inflict pain on Palestinian civilians, which of course who have suffered tremendously in this 50-day-old conflict, but the the operation to, uh, to go after Hamas uh, remains in place while this uh, humanitarian pause and these exchange of uh, of hostages and the release of. Palestinian prisoners continues, please. Right, sir. Also, I'll just let my viewers know that these are the live visuals that we're getting from the Sheba Medical Center in Tel Aviv. These are the live visuals that are coming in at this uh, point. Of course, we're tracking the developments on this truce very closely here. Now, sir, also we've seen that mediation efforts by Egypt and Qatar have continued. They are, in fact, hoping for an extension to this four-day tru uh, truce. So do you think an extension of this truce is in the offing? Well, that is, of course, the big question. Um, uh, hoping, of course, for uh, the the welfare of everyone concerned, including Palestinian civilians in Gaza, that the the next two days of the agreed four-day humanitarian pause will continue as planned, with the exchanges as planned. Uh, the the question, of course, is what happens then on the fifth day. Uh, now, the terms of the agreement that uh, negotiated with the assistance of Qatar and Egypt have not been made public, but it has been reported uh, uh, several times that Israel has agreed to extend the pause one day for each uh, additional 10 Israeli uh, hostages who've been released. And let me add here, quickly, there's been some attempt to try to equate the Israeli hostages, criminally seized some, including a now 10-month-old baby taken by Hamas, an Israeli baby, a Jewish baby taken by Hamas among the hostages criminally seized. There's been some effort to equate this with the Palestinian civilians. And I would just read here from the Secretary General of Amnesty International, who's, who writes, this is a, a quote from Agnes Kamayard, Secretary General of Amnesty International, in addition to horrific summary killings of civilians, which took place in several locations across southern Israel by Hamas, at least at this time, she was writing, 150 hostages have been taken into Gaza, including some children and foreign nationals. The, this is, she writes, Secretary General of Amnesty International, the abduction of civilians is prohibited by international law and hostage taking is a war crime. Again, that's the head of Amnesty International. So there's no e equivalence here. There's no equivalence between Palestinian, uh, who, Palestinians who have been arrested and received a court proceeding and imprisoned for, for example, attempted terrorism, and a three-year-old or even a nine-month-old baby seized by Hamas uh, in its uh, uh, criminal and horrific operation on October 7th. Please. Hmm. Mr. Joseph, thank you so much for joining us on the show with your insights and perspective on this. You're welcome. That was Mr. Edward P. Joseph joining us on the broadcast. We are, of course, tracking all the developments that are coming in from the Israel-Hamas war front where there it has a four-day truce is in effect. These are the live visuals that we're getting from the Sheba Medical Center in Tel Aviv. As you know, of course, the second batch of hostages have been released by Hamas. This includes 13 Israelis and four Thai nationals, which have been released in the second batch in this swap that is taking place currently. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has been monitoring this prisoner and hostage exchange since yesterday. We will, of course, continue to bring you all the developments on this. These are the live visuals that we're getting in right now from Sheba Medical Center. Of course, we'll keep bringing you the live visuals from Tel Aviv, Israel. Now we're starting with all the updates on the hostage prisoner swap. Emotional scenes were unfolding as Israeli children and women held captive by Hamas militants in Gaza 
for a grueling 49 days were released and finally reunited with their families under Qatar and Egypt as well as US broker deal. Israeli families welcomed the second group of hostages after Hamas had delayed the release by several hours earlier, accusing Israel of violating the terms of the true deal. The last-minute delay created a tense standoff but ultimately went through after international mediation efforts. One can only imagine the plight of the families that have been waiting for the hostages to come back home. Emily Hand had her ninth birthday as a hostage in Gaza, the day before she was reunited with her father, who initially believed she'd been killed in the devastating attack by a masked gunman on southern Israel last month. <laughs> You can see these visuals on your screens right now. Rounding the corner of a hospital corridor, nine-year-old Ohad Ran hurling himself into the arms of his father after being held by militants in Gaza for nearly seven weeks. The young boy who spent his ninth birthday as a hostage in Gaza was among four children freed from captivity. We started a campaign uh, a day ago that for celebrating with Ohad, every, everyone who can uh, should uh, hang a balloon wherever he wants, uh, on the car, on the houses, in the offices. Uh, the color is not that uh, important, but uh, Ohad liked, uh, the team that Ohad liked in uh, Israel, their uh, uh, color is red. A relative of a freed nine-year-old Israeli boy said that the puzzle not yet complete after the family reunion. Three out of four family members of the Munda family. Nine-year-old Ohad, his mother Karen and grandmother Ruthie were released from captivity in Gaza and brought back to Israeli soil. Ruthie's 78-year-old husband Avraham Munda still remains in Gaza in Hamas's custody. Not just this family, many other families were united. An Israeli father rejoiced at reuniting with his wife and daughters who returned to Israel on Friday after being held hostage for weeks by Hamas. Yoni Katz Asher hugged his family. Schneider's children, at Schneider Children Medical Center, pardon me, after their 50-day ordeal. For Yoni Katz Asher, whose wife and children were freed from Hamas captivity, there was happiness mingled with concern for those who remained in Gaza still. Others echoed that sentiment. Among them, Adva and Elon, the grandchildren of 85-year-old Yafa Adar as well.